Good morning. How how we doing? Uh, I am the first person at Calvary to use the Justin Bieber headset microphone who has a beard. So if you hear scratching throughout the message, it is not the static, it is my beard hitting the microphone. But I will do my best. I want to start today actually with a disclaimer. And that is this. Uh, Historically speaking, the church, the, the big C global church, is really good at telling people when they are wrong, something that we excel in. Um, Sometimes we are even good at telling people the things that they can do in order to be right. But seldom, rarely, has the church been historically good at walking people from where they are to where we are calling them to be. And I think that's important because we don't want to be that way here. And so my disclaimer is, if there's something in this talk or in any talk here at Calvary that makes you think about something differently than you have been perceiving it in the past, we want to have conversations with you. Myself, I would love to have a conversation with you. I know Pastor Bob Wood and Jonathan, the people who will be up here praying at the end of service would love to talk to you, the ministry leaders. We want to have honest conversations, even when honest conversations are messy conversations. I think that's important to say on the front end of anything else today. So that being said, we're continuing with our Galatians series. Um, We've been talking about freedom, the freedom that we find in Christ. And so some of the things that we've been talking about, we are free from. We are free from the consequences of not measuring up to the standard that God has set. We are free from the consequences of our sin, meaning this, we will do the wrong thing sometimes. We will make mistakes, we will do things intentionally that are wrong, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are free from experiencing the separation from God that we deserve as a result of those things. We are also free from the shame of our mistakes and the free from the shame of our past, meaning we are not doomed to cyclically repeat destructive behaviors that we have been ashamed of because Jesus has paid the price for those things. And when we find freedom in him, we are free from that cycle. Finally, we talked about we are free from the fear that we could lose our place in God's family. So we're considered children of God and heirs to the entirety of this world and the world that is to come, a perfect eternity, a perfect world. And we're heirs to that because of what Jesus did on the cross and in a now empty tomb, meaning our actions do not affect our familial status in God's family. It's a lot of good things to be free from. And so today what I want to talk about is how do you use the freedom that you have been given? We're picking up in Galatians chapter 5. This is verse 13. It says this. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. This whole series, we've been talking about the things that we are free from. And now this is what we hear. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Serve one another humbly in love. Walk by the spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. The flesh is contrary to the spirit. The spirit is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other and you are not to do whatever you want to do. So we've been talking this whole series about the things that we're free from. And now all of a sudden it feels like we're being given these restrictions on that freedom. You're free, but don't use your freedom for this. Use it for this. It feels like our freedom that we were just given, that we've been talking about, that we've been celebrating, now is being revoked. You are not to do whatever you want. So how do we reconcile those two things? How can we be free and not free at the same time? I think it's important to rework the way that we think about what Paul is saying here. Uh, When I was a kid... Every year, my family would take trips to Ocean City, Maryland. Great times. And for those of you who ever took a trip, there's this concept of something called a souvenir. And if you don't know what that means, basically, uh, my parents would say, 
we are, going, we are going to give you a gift while you are on vacation that is special for this trip. You get to choose what that gift is going to be. Very exciting at 11 years old. And there was one year, I remember my sister and I, my sister Jenny and I, we wanted for our souvenir to take surfing lessons, as you can see. So we had, I didn't ask for her permission to use this picture, so if you can't find me after service, please send up a call for distress. We had the time of our lives. We fell so many times. At one point, Jenny fell, and the surf instructor was like, ooh. I thought to myself, if you're the one saying, ooh, we're in trouble. <laughs> but we had so much fun. It is legitimately, I look back, it's one of my favorite vacation memories of my entire life. I loved it. Another year, I used my souvenir, my gift, to purchase this. On Amazon, this is listed as a slippery, tricky, wiggly, wiggler tube. <laughs> Needless to say, it is not one of my favorite vacation memories looking back. I broke it in two days. Not a good time. The point is this. I was given the same gift in both situations. When you're given a gift, you get to choose what to do with it. But not all choices bring about the same quality of your life. So here's what Paul is getting at here. Your freedom from shame, your admission into God's family, Jesus bought that for you. That's a gift. You get it. What you do with it, that's up to you. And not all uses of your freedom will result in the same quality of your life. So we're given two real choices, two avenues of what to do with our freedom. We have to indulge the flesh or to serve one another humbly in love. What does it mean to indulge the flesh? I'm not gonna get too deep into that right now. We'll come back to it later. Uh, but what I want you to know is essentially to indulge the flesh is I can use the freedom that God has given me in Christ to try to get what I want when I want it all the time. What I want when I want it all the time. The other option that we're given is to serve one another humbly in love. And I actually think that this is a pretty straightforward command. Serve one another humbly in love. And the only thing that I want to clarify is this word humbly. Because I think that sometimes uh, people who follow Jesus struggle with feeling as though in order to really serve someone else in humility, you have to see yourself as dirty. You have to see yourself as less than. Like if I, if I am going to see myself in my proper light, I need to be seen as low. And I actually think that not only is that not true, but it's also not healthy. Because what happens if you love, live your life in a place of trying to see yourself as dirty is one, you will allow yourself to be treated in ways that are not healthy for you and that are not healthy for somebody else. And two, you will hide your gifts when you're trying to serve other people. And so in actuality, you won't serve them to the best of your abilities. We associate humility with self-deprecation. I grew up feeling as though if I wanted to truly be humble, I had to understand how bad I was. I had to understand the ways that I was sinful. I had to understand my attitudes and my actions and my thoughts that were all wrong. And if I could understand those things, I'd be humble. And what I found is that didn't allow me to serve anybody better. What it allowed me to be is ashamed of myself. There's this quote from a Jewish rabbi about humility that I love. He says, humility is not thinking that you are small. It is thinking that other people have greatness in them. This is what I've found to be true. If I believe that I am made in the image of God, and as such, there is greatness in me, and I believe that you are made in the image of God, and as such, there is greatness in you. If I hold those two things in weight together, I am now able to serve you using the gifts God has placed in me without needing to belittle myself in the process. And that is what it means to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so to serve one another humbly in love is not to self-deprecate in humility. It is to recognize and call out the greatness in other people. That is love. And what is the result of a life that is lived in this way? This is what it says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. This is what we've talked about this whole series, 
That if you, if you are led by the Spirit, if you live in the freedom that God has given you, you are free from the condemnation of the mistakes that you've made and the mistakes that you will make. You're free from the fear that God would ever not love you. And the effects of this, which we're not going to talk a ton about today, but we're going to talk a lot about next week. The effects of this are love and joy. You experience peace. You grow in patience and kindness and goodness. And is that not the life that we all want? But there is another option for how we can use our freedom. And Paul lists it a little too explicitly here for anybody to be comfortable with it. This is what it says, continuing in Galatians chapter five. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the temperature in the room rose five degrees. There are many difficult things about this passage, but one of them is that these words are truthfully old and hard to understand sometimes. And so one of the things that I love uh, Timothy Keller does is he gives the Greek word and then defines it. So I'm gonna go through this list again of the things that are the acts of the flesh with definitions that I think are a little easier for us to understand coming from the Greek words themselves. In the topic of sex, sorry, it's my bad. On the topic of sex, sexual intercourse between unmarried people, unnatural sexual practices and relationships, uncontrolled sexuality, and the topic of the occult and spirituality, providing an inadequate substitute for God, faking the work of the spirit. In our attitudes, a competitive self-seeking motive, a coveting and desiring of what others have, zeal that comes from a hungry ego, hostility and an adversarial attitude, in our relationships, and I actually think in our relationships this year, if you think about the fact that it's an election year, seeking to pick fights, outbursts of anger, divisions between people, permanent parties, and warring groups. In substance abuse, uh, drunkenness and orgies are actually linked together. So it's an addiction to pleasure-creating substances and to pleasure-creating behaviors. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uncomfortable. This is what we often call the judgment of God. It's, it's the result of when we try to get what we want, when we want it, all the time. And so what I want to talk about now are there are three common reactions when we read this passage. And the first one is that we read it and we are afraid. Strangely enough, I'd actually say this is the easiest one to address. This is the fear where you read this list of things and then you get to the end and it says, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you're, in your mind, you're like, okay, so like I've, I trust Jesus. I put my faith in Jesus, but I still see myself in this list. I have the desires at the very least to do these things. And truthfully, I still do these things sometimes. You know, I, I, I want these things sometimes. I want to explode in anger. I struggle with not wanting what other people have. I want to get drunk. We literally just said that for somebody who accepts and commits their life to Christ, that they don't need to fear their loss of status in God's family. And now all of a sudden we have this list of things and tacked onto the end of it. Those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I have good news for you, afraid people. If the judgment of God makes you afraid, today you can remember the power of the cross. Because you have to read this passage as a whole. And what does it say about the spirit of God and the law? It says, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Here's the truth. You are incapable of following every rule. I'm sorry if I'm the first person that's ever said that to you. You can't even follow the rules you set up for yourself. Most of us set a January 1st uh, New Year's resolution and January 4th, we gave up. We are incapable 
of following every rule. That is just the truth. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, breaking the rules cannot disqualify you from being a part of God's family. And that's the good news. Jesus took the weight of justification off of your shoulders and carried it on his. And so if you have declared with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. That's it. That's the good news for my, my, my afraid people. If the judgment of God makes you afraid, remember the power of God in Christ. I love this analogy that Tim Keller uses. He says, if you have a city that is ruled by an evil, rebellious force, that force, while it is in power, controls the entirety of the city. When a good king comes and expels that rebel force from the community, the king now rules the city. And the truth is that the rebel force, the evil forces, they're pushed to the outskirts of that city and they may even still have some influence in the city itself, but they don't rule it anymore. If you have declared with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the king rules the city of your life. You are saved because of what Jesus did. And if you commit your life to him, you have nothing to fear. So that's our first reaction, and I'm not going to lie, the next reactions get a little bit dicier. The second reaction to this difficult passage is you finish reading it, and your first question is, why should God tell me who I can and cannot sleep with? Why should he be able to tell me who I can and cannot hate? Why should he be, tell me, why should he be able to tell me if I can explode in anger, if I can be jealous? Why should I not be able to get everything that I want? Why can I not get drunk? Why would I have to listen to his standards for my life? And this is the reaction of resentment. And this is going to sound strange. If you see the judgment of God as a restriction intended to limit your life, you need to understand the love that God displayed for you in Jesus Christ. Because what you need to understand is the magnitude of the price at which you were bought. Our opening verse this morning was God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were sinners... While we were haters of God, while we were as screwed up as screwed up can be, Christ died for us. He died for the ungodly. If you read this passage and you feel like God is the teacher who won't let you go outside to recess like you want to, then what you are looking for is an apathetic God. Because what you are looking for is a God that will say, do what you want. I do not want to intervene. And my question to you would be this. If an eight-year-old daughter went to her father and asked for the keys to his car because she wanted to drive and he gave them to her, would you call that love? My dad, who I love, he's the best, he would fall asleep in his lazy boy reclining chair at night and wait for us to come home from wherever we were. And I remember there was a night I came home at like, 12.45 a.m., give or take. And I remember I walked in, and he woke up, and he very gently, but firmly, was like, you should not stay out that late again. And in that moment, he was enforcing a curfew, like those of you who have parents, have, you've had that done to you, and those who are a parent, you've probably done it to your children before. And in that moment, I found that I had the option to see that as a restriction on the freedoms of my life. But I knew how much my dad loved me. And he had proved it again and again and again. So instead of seeing something that he was saying as a restriction, I could recognize in that moment that even though I didn't understand it all, he might see consequences to my actions that I couldn't see. He could see the consequences that I couldn't. And a good father will help their children avoid those consequences even when they can't see it themselves. We do not love God because he gave us rules to follow. We follow the rules and the laws that God has given us because he already proved to us how much he loves us. And the magnitude of that love is found in this bloody cross, in this now empty tomb where God himself became a man and took on a punishment of everything that I deserve. And a God that loves me that much, a God that loves you that much, that he would die in your place and take your punishment. That God 
who gave you that freedom would not then turn around and say, but actually I don't want you to live it to the fullest that you could. A God that loves you that much would not turn around and say, here are some restrictions to make your life more challenging and less fulfilling than it could be. But what he would do is he would put tools and guidelines in your life to help you live it in the freest, fullest, best possible way. That's what a good father does. And so if, if the judgment of God makes you feel resentful of him, then what we have to understand is the love of the cross. We have to understand a father's love for us. And here's the thing about my father is that the reason that I understood his love for me in that moment was because we had spent time together. And I fully recognize that some of you do not have a relationship with your earthly father, have not had a relationship with your earthly father in which it was shown to you what it looks like for a father to want to spend time with his children. But let me promise you this morning, your heavenly father wants to spend time with you. And so how do you learn how much God loves you? You spend time with him. The more that you study the words of God, the more that you spend time in prayer, the more that you spend time intentionally with him, then you start to understand the love that God has for you. And when you spend time understanding that, processing that, remembering that, then the things that you were seeing as walls stopping you from getting what you wanted become the guidelines of helping you to live the healthiest possible life. A good father loves. So we talked about fear, Talked about resentment. There's a third response to this passage, and that is you read it and you're like, finally, <laughs> these sinners will get what they deserve. <laughs> you'd be like, we've been doing this whole series about freedom. Where's the justice? And we'd be like, you know what? You read it once and you're like, read it again, read it again. you born on, you're like, you, no kingdom for you. You, no kingdom for you. No kingdom for you. We're like reverse Oprah. <laughs> Here's what I think. Those of us who think like that, and I am one of you, there are plenty of times in which I think like this. Those of us that think like that, we miss the point maybe more than anybody. Because if the judgment of God makes you feel righteous about yourself, you have forgotten the grace of God in Christ. There's a parallel passage to this one in 1 Corinthians 6. It starts and says, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then it lists a bunch of the same things that so sorry. And then it lists a bunch of the same things that we talked about here. And then it gets to the end and it says, and that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. It was you. Self-righteous buddies, it was you. Jesus hung there for you. And God doesn't say that someone else's sexual immorality is more sinful than the fits of rage that you show towards your family. And he doesn't say that someone else's drunkenness is more sinful than the permanent warring party that you will go after people on in the comment sections of Instagram and Facebook. And he doesn't say that their orgy is more sinful than your picking fights with your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your daughter or your parent. If the judgment of God makes you feel righteous in yourself, you have to understand the grace of the cross because only then can you not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but rather to serve another in love. And here's why. When you understand that God's grace is for you, you now understand that it is not a case of who is right and who is wrong. It is a case of all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And if that includes you, but it also includes me, and the second part is true as well, which is all can be justified in his righteousness. Only then can I see the person across from me and say, I can serve you in love knowing that I am created in the image of God and therefore there's greatness in me and you are created in the image of God and therefore there's greatness in you. But in order to do that, we have to understand that grace is for all. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come back up. So I talked about a lot of unhealthy ways, unhealthy reactions, things that lead to an unhealthy life. There does have to be a healthy option for reading this passage. Otherwise, I feel like God wouldn't have included it in his word. And I think the healthiest way that we can look at this passage is to read it and then ask ourselves a question. And this is the question. Who is the authority of my life? Who gets listened to at the end of the day? 
And here's what I've learned. It, it cannot be me. You know why? Because when I'm tired, I snap at my wife. And when I'm hungry, I snap at my friends. And that's two examples of a whole host of inconsistencies that exist in my life. And if you are honest with yourself, you can see the inconsistencies in yours as well. We are not consistently good enough to be the authority in our own lives. But when I look at the cross and when I look at what Jesus did there, what God the Father allowed to occur, what he sent Jesus to occur, there I see a perfect love that casts out fear. And there I see arms that are stretched wide enough that they would welcome a sinner home no matter how far they have gone or what they have done if they will only turn and find faith in him. And there I see a grace that eliminates any chance that I could ever have at pride in myself. So we sing the, the old hymn, it says, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him and in his presence I will daily live. Because that's who I wanna trust with everything. Someone who already proved to me how much he loves me. So I surrender my fear. I surrender my resentment. I surrender my judgments. And I listen. And I listen because I trust him. And I trust him because I love him. And I love him because he already loved me first. And he showed me that by taking a punishment that I deserved and a death that I deserved so that I could have a freedom that I don't. And because of that, because of love, his words are life to me and life to the full. And because of that, I want to follow him. I want to use my freedom to love others. So we're gonna sing. And I, I wanna reiterate again that if something hit you or even if something hurt you this morning, do not let it hit or hurt you alone. I, I, I'll be here at least for a little while after service. Um, and Pastor Bob is here and Jonathan is here. And there are people who are gonna be at the front of the room that wanna pray with you. There are ministry leaders in our church. Find anybody. We want to walk with you. And hear me on this. God loves you. And I'm sorry if someone has told you that he doesn't because of the things that you have done. That is not true. He wants what is best for you as a good father does. And next week, we're gonna talk a ton about what, love, what life looks like in the arms of a good father. What walking in freedom looks like. Because the truth is that a good father doesn't just tell you what's wrong, he also shows you what is right. And God is a good father and he loves you. Would you pray with me? Lord, giving over the things that uh, we hold close, even when those things are fear and our resentment and our desires and our pride and our judgment, giving those things over to you takes a strength that we do not have. And so Holy Spirit, I ask that you would give us a supernatural strength to be able to let go this morning, to be able to recognize the grace and the love and the power of the cross and to lean into that. We surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand, sing with us?